Hi everyone! In the next few videos, I'm going to be talking about experiencing MIS Chapter 1. Now, I want to really emphasize the fact that this video does not substitute for actually reading the textbook. I'm going to cover some of the same information that the textbook does, but I really do think there's a value to both watching this video and reading through the textbook. Part of the reason why I'm saying this is because of the different perspective that I bring to some of this material versus the perspectives that the authors bring to this material. I come from a very technical background. My area of study in college was computer science, and I can really get into a lot of the more technical aspects of, well, the actual technology that they talk about in these chapters. On the other hand, the authors of Experiencing MIS, they have much more of a business background. So they're actually able to, I would say better talk about the business applications of this technology. Now, also what's important is that I'm recording this in 2022. This was written in the late 2010s, I believe 2018 or 2019 is when the specific edition that we're covering in class was written. So I can provide some clarifications on things that might have changed since that textbook was published. Now, for sake of time, I won't be covering everything that is in the textbook. I would still recommend reading through the textbook, reading through all of the material in each chapter, because they do have a lot of really useful information there. One example is that in chapter one, they talk about careers that incorporate the different components of MIS that we'll be discussing in this chapter, and I don't really cover that in my lecture videos, so I would look into what they're talking about for, you know, careers-wise to see the different aspects of MIS and how different careers can you know, interact with those different aspects. So there's a lot of very valuable information in the textbook that I just am not able to get around to in my own lecture videos. But yeah, that that's my encouragement to read the textbook. So. I highly recommend you do that. It has a lot of really good information in there. So without further ado, let's get into it. So in this video, I really want to justify why taking this class is so important. You might have looked through some of the CBiz or CBOG classes on offer in the catalog and seen that there are individual classes for Microsoft Word, Excel, Access, PowerPoint, all that kind of stuff. You might have also noticed that CBiz 101 specifically is required, whereas some of these other classes may not be required depending on your major. And you might be wondering, well, why am I taking CBiz 101, which covers four applications and also this MIS thing, instead of just taking the classes that cover those applications and like really, really get into detail on those applications. And the reason why is because we also offer the talk about MIS. So then I think a very valid question to follow up that chain of reasoning with is, well, who cares, right? I mean, especially if you already have some pretty decent knowledge of Microsoft Word and Excel and PowerPoint, and you know maybe you haven't used Access, but how hard could it be to pick that up, right? So then who cares about this MIS thing? And I think that's totally reasonable to ask. Like, it's totally justified to ask why it's so important to take this class, why we think it's necessary for you to be in this class. And the reason why is because we're not just looking at these applications, we're looking at technology at a higher level. And you should care about this class because of that, because we're looking at technology at that higher level. We live in the information age. We live in an age where Businesses are created because of information. Businesses get destroyed because they're not using information right or they're not generating the right type of information. Everything is about data. Everything is about information. And you need to learn how to work with that. That's what we're talking about in this class. Technology is constantly evolving. We're constantly changing, and it's really important as well to gain the skills to look at what's happening and be like, okay, what direction is this going? What knowledge should I gain in order to keep up with the pace of rapid technological 
evolution. And that's what we try to talk about in this class as well. Where is technology going? How can you learn about that technology? How can you anticipate it? Or how can you, you know, to put it in more of a surfing metaphor, how can you catch a new wave? How can you tell when a big wave is coming and how can you catch it so you can absolutely shred it like the coolest Keanu Reeves type surfer there ever was? Really, really important skill nowadays. And we try to talk about this in our class. When I talk about technology evolving constantly, there are various laws that kind of describe the evolution of technology. They're not necessarily like, you know, the, the textbook will call these laws fundamental forces of evolution. And I personally disagree that they're fundamental forces. I see them more as observational laws that have happened to hold, held up for quite a while. So we use them to try to predict where technology might be going. You can't necessarily 100% rely on them, but they do a really great job describing how technology changes over time. So let's get into some of these laws. The first one of these laws that we're going to talk about is Bell's Law, formulated by Gold Gordon Bell in 1972. And he said that a new class of computers is going to establish a new industry each decade. Now, the reason why he said this, in 1972, he found himself in the middle of what was known as the digital revolution. So I talked about in the computer fundamentals video how computers evolved from these like massive, massive calculating machines. And they started getting more and more and more complex. And what we saw in 1970s is that businesses were taking more and more and more advantage of computers over analog machines, over machines that don't necessarily use computing power in order to automate tasks. So he saw that computers are being used more often to do calculations, to run all these programs that were helping businesses become more and more powerful. And he formulated that just like the digital revolution was creating this new industry of computer manufacturers, every decade would see a new innovation that would establish a new industry. And he happened to be right because every decade we have seen technology progress to the point where massive industries are coming out of new technologies that are happening. For example, in the 1980s, we saw the rise of the personal computer and lo local networks. The personal computer being a computer that is actually small enough that any person could theoretically own an actual computer or they're becoming cheap enough that every person at a business could have their own dedicated computer rather than everyone having to rely on one giant mainframe and they would have to you know take turns running programs on it and stuff like that the personal computer allowed for each person in a business to have their own workstation that they could do their own computer, you know, run their own computer programs on without having to worry about interference from other people's stuff. Local networks think the internet, but scaled extremely far down. This was the progenitor of the World Wide Web as we know it, where every business would have their computers sort of wired up together so that they could communicate between each other. There were also like educational networks. There was the ARPANET, which connected a lot of uh, a lot of businesses and schools and research facilities across the country. So these smaller scale networks allowed for mass communication across this giant network and eventually would lead to the World Wide Web. So that was the 1980s. Uh, we come into the 1990s and that's actually where we start seeing the World Wide Web actually happening. Um, all of these smaller networks start getting connected up and all of a sudden more and more and more computers across the world are able to connect to each other. They're able to visit servers in other countries. They're able to communicate in seconds or minutes, I guess, back in the 1990s when it would have taken hours or days or weeks or months to communicate before these worldwide webs. We're looking at... Um, fiber optic cables being laid across the ocean. We're looking at large communication networks being built up in countries that didn't really have that infrastructure before. We also saw the advent and popularization. I shouldn't say the advent of the cellular phone because they did exist. 
uh, much earlier than the 1990s, but the technology had progressed to a point where cellular phones actually became affordable and people actually started buying them so that they could communicate when they weren't tied to a landline. So we saw those two industries pop up, uh, industries based on the internet. So if you've ever heard of the dot-com boom, that was the end result of a huge amount of internet-based companies where you would order something from the internet, order some kind of product or service from the internet, and that product or service would be given to you through that company. 1990s is where we saw the rise of Amazon. Um, that was the type of stuff that led to Netflix as well. Um, big companies like that. That was all thanks to innovations in the 1990s. In the 2000s, we saw the advent and rise of social networking as well as cloud services. So with social networking, that kind of took over the niche that forums used to hold on the internet. So forums are a, um, they're, they're still around uh, as much as they can be hard to find nowadays, but they are essentially what Reddit is trying to be. I suppose you have a forum based on a certain idea. So one forum that's around right now that is still going pretty strong is the Lost Media Wiki forum, where a lot of people are trying to track down and archive media that has been lost over the ages. Um, so a forum, that forum is all about finding and recovering lost pieces of media. And then there's different topics. So there's a topic within a forum is actually like a group of discussions that are sort of, well, around the same topic. In the Lost Media Wiki, one of the topics is, hey, I remember this thing from when I was a child, but I can't find anything about it. Do any of you remember it? And can we possibly try to find it? Another one is, another topic is, hey, I just found this thing. Uh, here's where you can access it from, and so on and so forth. And then within topics, there's actual individual conversations. They start out with an original post, and then that has a whole bunch of replies to continue the conversation. And that idea ended up getting taken over by social networking, which was much more generalized. It was much more about your life. It was much more about connecting with friends that you had in real life rather than actually, you know, talking with strangers about common interests. Instead, you're going on Facebook and you're friending all the people that you went to high school with, and then maybe you have common interests. Maybe you don't have them anymore, but you want to keep those people on your Facebook friends list because you would feel bad if you, you know, unfriended them or something like that. So that's the direction that we started seeing in the early 2000s. The other big one is cloud services, and cloud services are essentially services that aren't actually based on your computer, but rather that you access from another company's server. And a great example of this is actually Microsoft Office 365. If you access the Microsoft Office suite through your web browser, you are taking advantage of a cloud service. OneDrive is another cloud service. You are hosting your data on Microsoft's servers. So that is a, a service that is being provided through the cloud. We both we saw both of those rise pretty sharply in the 2000s. I think a big cloud service that really came to be at that time was um, Google Drive, you know, with like the idea of Google Docs, Google Slides, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Pandora Radio, iHeartRadio would all be cloud services because you're accessing them through the cloud, through the internet. Now for the 2010s, the authors have identified a number of technologies that they see as being really important. Um, they talk a lot about artificial intelligence, 3D printing, digital reality devices, self-driving vehicles, and cryptocurrencies. And from a technical standpoint, actually really being in that area of research in college I really want to say that I, I personally think machine learning developments were the biggest thing to come out of the 2010s. And to each of those other technologies' credit, we saw a huge amount of development in all of them. We saw huge developments in 3D printing, in digital reality devices, in 
uh, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. Um, but machine learning, that was just an insane leap forward in the 2010s. So back in the day, uh, you might have heard about Kasparov versus Deep Blue. Deep Blue was a artificially intelligent chess player. It was designed to generate possible board states. It was designed to look at the state of the board, of the chessboard, and look at the last move that its opponent made and generate every possible future move that it could make and then identify which one of those future moves is going to be best, which one is going to be more valuable for it to make, whether it's taking another piece or preventing another one of its important pieces to be lost, um, maybe sacrificing pieces or stuff like that. It was designed to try to strategically figure out which move to take in a relatively limited amount of time. And Deep Blue won. And that was a huge, considered a huge step forward in artificial intelligence. Well, in the early 2000s, we had another one of those huge steps forwards steps forward in terms of AlphaGo. Go is another board game. It is an incredibly complicated board game. It is much more complicated than chess ever could be. And because of that, we couldn't use the same techniques that Deep Blue did in order to play Go. You can't actually predict every single possible board state and then figure out which is most valuable and then go from there because that would just take up too much computation power. So instead, the engineers that created AlphaGo turned to machine learning rather than actually telling it to generate every possible move and look at every possible ending of the game and then figure out the best ending for itself. It instead learned how to play the game from masters of Go, from human players. So machine learning is a method of creating an artificial intelligence. And AlphaGo really, I think, heralded this massive development in machine learning systems. And then through the end of the 2010s, we just saw more and more and more complex machine learning algorithms come out. Uh, to the point now where you have these really, really incredible um, machine learning systems that can generate images, that can generate text that we never could have dreamed of at the beginning of the 2010s. So not only that, but in the 2010s, a lot of businesses were able to form based on machine learning software. Can we take this problem that has been notoriously difficult and can we throw machine learning at that problem to make it a lot easier? In the 2010s, I actually had applied for a job at a company that was using artificial intelligence to try to figure out the best wine pairing for certain meals or to figure out, you know, what wines to recommend to a certain person. They were doing chemical analysis of those wines to figure out the different chemical components of the wines, feeding that into artificial intelligence. And then the other piece of data they were feeding in was like people's different preferences. So like the different types of foods they liked, comparing that to the different wines that they liked. And then the idea was they can make a system where if you put in like, I like this food, I don't like this food, I like this food, I don't like this food they could take that body of knowledge that they trained the machine learning system on and use that system to recommend you a good wine for you that you might really enjoy and, you know, make the problem even more complex by making it a wine that you will enjoy that also pairs well with a certain meal. So that's just like one incredibly small example of the amount of businesses that spawned out of the developments in machine learning. So for my money, that's what I would say is the biggest development of the 2010s. If you had to sum it up in one statement, machine learning developments are the biggest technological boom that we've saw in the 2010s. Now, of course, come 10 years, will I be eating my words? Maybe, but who knows? And then finally, the new class of computers in the 2010s, who knows, right? We are only, as of the recording of this video, we are 
two and three quarters years into the 2010s. And at this point, I would say that it's too early to say definitively. I could make some guesses. Um, I don't want to make them on this video for fear of embarrassing myself, embarrassing myself by saying something without, you know, putting in the right amount of research. But there's a lot of possible contenders out there, and it'll be interesting to see how this decade goes, technologically speaking. Regardless, the takeaways that we should be taking from Bell's Law as business professionals is that technology is constantly changing, and you need to learn about how to learn about new technology. You need to be able to see the direction that things are going, and even if you can't work with that technology yourself, even if you can't, say, work with a massive machine learning system yourself, if you can't create that machine learning system, you need to be able to say, okay, but I know that machine learning systems can do this, so machine learning systems would be helpful for my business or for whatever aspect of the business that I'm currently working on is. So this is what we need to do in order to keep up or in order to make a successful business or successful product or anything like that. And that is a big aspect of what we're trying to talk about in this class. The next law I'm going to talk about is Moore's Law, named after Gordon Moore, uh, one of the co-founders of the Intel Corporation. Now, Intel is best known for making processors, which are the actual brain of a computer. Now, in 1965, Moore said that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated chip doubles every 18 months or so. And this has held relatively true. Um, it, it's been somewhat accurate over the years ever since he said that in 1965. As a quick aside, transistors are the core unit of any computing hardware. They are essentially very, very, very small switches that uh, can either allow electricity to pass through or don't allow electricity to pass through. We can assemble these transistors together to make logic gates, and we assemble those logic gates together to make circuits that allow the computer to do computations to conditionally execute certain lines of code. So based on a certain condition that's happening in the computer right now, is the computer going to actually execute a specific line or is it going to skip elsewhere? That is some of the stuff that makes a computer really a computer. So transistors are very fundamental units of computers Therefore, the more transistors you're able to cram into a circuit, the more powerful your circuit is able to be. And if you can have a chip with billions and billions of these transistors in it, it's going to be able to execute calculations incredibly fast. And that's what we've been seeing is as um, the time has gone on, the price per million transistors has actually sharply decreased to the point where in 2018 there um it costs about two cents to produce one million transistors and a processor is going to have billions of these now moore's law at some point is going to be limited by how small you can actually make transistors because the more transistors we put into a computer chip the smaller that those transistors actually have to be in order to fit into a computer chip of a reasonable size. And typically what we end up doing is we care less nowadays about how many transistors we can actually fit into a single chip. And we care more about, you know, how many individual processors can we actually put in our computer's brains. So your computer right now probably doesn't just have one processor, it probably has two or four or eight processors working in tandem, all simultaneously accomplishing different tasks. So Moore's Law itself doesn't necessarily drive processing technology forward, but it is a really important observation in how much we can make a single processor do. The takeaway of Moore's Law is that it becomes cheaper to process data as time passes. Now, we're not 
necessarily saying this in order to say like, oh, well, if you are building a business, right, you need to make sure that all of your computers have all of the best processors so that all of your computers can do all of that processing yourself. Typically what we do when we have a lot of data that we need to process, and if you're running a business nowadays, you probably will have a lot of data that you need to process. Typically you're outsourcing the intensive processing work out to the cloud. So Google or Amazon servers or other sort of server hosters where you might put your technology on their servers in order to process the data that you're getting in. Why, why this law is important, why this takeaway is important is they really care about the speed of their processors. They care a lot about how crazy good their CPUs are. So the cheaper it is for those guys to buy really good computer hardware and build up their server infrastructure, the cheaper it is for us small fries to rent that service space or to use their services. So it is cheaper for us to either have them process our data for us or it's cheaper for us to host something that can process the data on their servers as time passes is usually how this goes. All right, so the next law that we're going to talk about is Metcalfe's law. It's named after the inventor of the ethernet, uh, Robert Metcalfe. It wasn't actually said by him. This was formulated in 1993 by a guy named George Glider, but that guy formulated that the value of a network is equal to the square of the number of users connected to it. So the more people that are connected to a certain network, the more valuable that network is. The, now, this was formulated before we actually had the World Wide Web. This was back when there were much smaller networks that would be owned by a very specific entity or multiple entities or something like that. So back in the day, this was saying like, hey, the more devices you got on that specific network that this business owns, the more valuable that that network is. Now, and the textbook doesn't really say this, but this law, I mean, it kind of applies to the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web has billions of devices connected to it. And the value of the World Wide Network World Wide Web would be probably, you know, about that amount of money. It would be an inconceivable amount of money up in the quadrillions if one person were to try to buy it all. Um, but we can apply Metcalfe's law to a smaller scale as well. We can apply it to a company's individual ecosystem, you know, or services or something like that. The more devices people own, that are using a particular service and that are feeding that data to that service's servers, the more money that the company that owns that service can make off of them. So we can use this in the sense of data and advertising. And that's actually the takeaway that I have right here. The more users you have, the more money you can make from them. For example, um, Amazon. The more users that Amazon was getting, the more money it was able to make from them. Not just from the fact that Amazon, you know, people were purchasing goods and stuff through Amazon, but also the fact that people were feeding their data to Amazon. Amazon was able to tell what kind of products they were buying, what kind of searches they were making. They were able to build these massive advertising profiles about people, and then they're able to use those advertising profiles to sell more things or able to sell that advertising data to other companies, or at least say to other companies, hey, we can use this advertising profile to feed your ads to people. So the Amazon network has, or the Amazon ecosystem has a lot of value specifically because they're able to collect all of that data from people. Similar thing for Google. Google has access to all of the searches you're making. They are able to build up a lot of information about you just inferring it from the searches that you're making. 
And that's why their advertising network is so valuable and so powerful because they have so many users there. So the more users you have, the more money you can make from them by gathering their data, the more money your network, your ecosystem, your company is worth. Now, I want to clarify something that they talk about in the textbook right here. Uh, they give Google's Project Loon as an example of Metcalfe's law. They're talking about this project. It's a major effort to bring internet access to everyone on the planet using a network of inflated balloons floating around the world. Facebook also has a, or at least had a similar effort where they were using solar powered gliders, autonomous gliders, in order to essentially act a bit like satellite internet where they could intercept internet signals from satellites and then beam them down to people sort of in that general area. And Google and Facebook are trying to build up their own networks, but the textbook doesn't really talk about the reasoning behind this other than just saying that, well, by Net Metcalf's law, if they're able to get more people on their networks through Project Loon or through Facebook's um, autonomous glider project, which I'll, I'll, I'm not actually sure if that is still a thing anymore, but it was being talked about in the late 2010s. They don't talk about why Google and Facebook are doing this. The reason why is primarily about the data. If you are someone who is reliant on Google for all of your internet, whether that is through Google's Project Loon or whether that's through Google Fiber, which hasn't come to Santa Maria as far as I know, but was being implemented in major cities. If you're reliant on Google for all of your browsing data, then that means they can look at everything that you're doing and they can add all of that to your browsing or to your advertising profile. Whereas normally if you're someone like me, I'm using Spectrum for my internet, Google doesn't have access to Spectrum's data, at least not without purchasing it, which they might. But by default, Google would only have access to the stuff that you know I'm typing into a Google service. So the stuff that I'm making Google searches from and all that kind of stuff. The reason why Google is putting so much effort into stuff like Project Loon is because they want all that extra data. The more data they can get, the more valuable their network is, the more money they're able to make. That is the implication of that. That is how Metcalfe's law can be adapted to the modern internet ecosystem. The next law we'll talk about is Nielsen's law, formulated in 2014 by Jacob Nielsen, who observed that network connection speeds for high-end users will probably increase by 50% per year. Note specifically that this says high-end users. Uh, Low-end users typically are people who do not get the necessary uh, physical upgrades to actually have their speed increased. There's a lot of places in the United States where people still rely on broadband or satellite internet, which is are both extremely slow. And the reason why is because there's no infrastructure updates actually being made. Those infrastructure updates have to be made at the you know, city or state level and either cities or states don't have enough money for that or they just don't care about the people who need those internet upgrades. So a lot of people in rural areas do not see this 50% per year increase. But if you are rich and live in a city, uh, you will probably see 50% per year uh, network connection speed increase. Now, the reason why this is important for us is because as networks for people who you can make money off of become faster, services on the internet can become more powerful. So we saw YouTube come around in 2008 or so, I think, no, it was 2005, my apologies. In 2005, we actually saw the 
creation of YouTube, even though we'd been able to play videos on our own computers for decades. But the reason why YouTube had to wait until 2005 is because it had to wait for internet technology to sort of get to the point where you could stream video across that sort of connection. Similar thing for Netflix was that it uh, had to wait until, you know, 2000s to actually really get into streaming because it needed to wait for um, the actual network technology to catch up. Now, in like the 2000s and the early 2010s, I, I was actually living in rural Northern California and we had satellite internet for the longest time. And we were unable to really watch Netflix. We, we couldn't stream Netflix when a lot of people were able to, or we couldn't, I, I couldn't watch uh, YouTube at 480p, which was the highest uh, resolution supported at the time. I had to watch at like 240, maybe 360 if I was lucky and nobody else was using the internet at the time. So we were very bandwidth capped, but um, now living in San Luis Obispo, I'm able to do a lot more on the internet. I'm able to access a lot more services than I was as a kid back in mid to late 2000s, which has been a pretty uh, incredible change for me. Honestly, it, it still blows my mind how fast I can download things now compared to compared to back in the day. The last law I'll talk about is Kreider's Law. It's named after uh, Mark Kreider, uh, former chief technology officer at Seagate. Uh, Seagate is a company that manufactures storage. So uh, HDDs, hard disk drives, uh, drives that are based on using magnetic disks to store data. Uh, SSDs, solid state drives, which are more about using circuitry to store um, large amounts of data. Flash drives, micro SD cards, SD cards, all that kind of stuff. But in 2005, he said that the storage density on magnetic disks is increasing at an exponential rate. Now in 2005, uh, magnetic disks were the most used way of storing a large amount of data. And there's a good chance that if you have an older computer or if you got a relatively cheap hard drive uh, that you're probably using magnetic disks. Uh, HDDs are essentially layers and layers and layers of magnetic disks where they use um, electricity to actually encode data in the magnetic fields of these disks that can hold magnetic fields in, like different magnetic fields at different areas. So that is essentially um, what he was talking about back in that time. He was talking about this technology and how the storage density is increasing at an exponential rate, which means that you can fit more data on a disk. And when you can fit more data on a single disk, that means you need fewer disks to actually create a storage medium of a certain size. So what we have here is a graph, the price of storage capacity per gigabyte. The price to actually hold, uh, create a gigabyte's worth of information. It started out at $781.84 in 1995. It was really expensive to hold a gigabyte of information at least in one drive. And now it is incredibly inexpensive at three cents per gigabyte. So the takeaway here is that it is getting cheaper and cheaper to store more data. Now, odds are you're not going to be storing a ton of data yourself unless you're doing some like in-house archiving stuff, which is possible. Some businesses do that, but a lot of times what's going to happen is you're going to be using cloud storage to store data. So stuff like OneDrive or Google Drive or things like that. And if you're using cloud storage, what's really important here is that the cheaper it is for them to get a lot of storage on their servers, the cheaper it is for you to store data on their servers. Now there is a hard limit to Kreider's law. Uh, it's similar to Moore's law, how you, um, can only have 
so many transistors in a physical space before it gets to the point where we can't actually make transistors anymore. They're just too small. Um, with Kreider's Law, there's only... You can only get so much data on a magnetic disk before you just start getting all the magnetic fields kind of muddled with each other and we can't really tell the difference between each other. There is a physical limit. We haven't reached that yet, but it is there. So I talk about all these advances in technology. I talk about all the observations that people have made and how technology seems to improve and improve and improve at these what look like exponential rates. And I, I, I can talk about all this, but why am I talking about this? So what? Well, there's this increased movement to outsource a lot of menial labor to stuff like overseas workers or machine learning or stuff like that. So the menial labor, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about things like image recognition or data processing or coding or doing taxes, like filling out forms, all that kind of stuff. And companies are realizing that they can either automate some of those processes pretty easily using machine learning, or they can exploit overseas workers who may not have the best worker protection laws, like unlike uh, ours, which are maybe mid at best. Um, and they can pay those overseas workers a lot less money to do that kind of work. So in order to avoid, you know, possibly getting screwed over by this, there's an increased need for workers in countries like the United States of America to start building other skills, to not just be able to do that menial labor, but to have a better understanding of technology to have the ability to sort of have a much bigger picture side of things. Job security comes from what is known as non-routine cognition, uh, these skills that you actually have to learn rather than just coming a little bit more innately to everyone. And here are some of the skills that our textbook identifies as non-routine cognitive skills. Abstract reasoning. Abstract reasoning is the idea of making models and manipulating them. So what you do is you want to look at a real life situation. You want to be able to model that in some way and then manipulate that model in order to sort of solve that problem or figure out where you can make an improvement or something like that. You want to be able to look at something and you want to be able to generalize that to a much larger problem, much larger model, and you want to be able to use that properties of that model in order to actually solve the problem that you're looking at. And that's, you know, all of these skills we're actually going to try to emphasize and teach throughout this course. The next skill that the textbook emphasizes is systems thinking. And if you've ever gone down a Wikipedia rabbit hole and ended up somewhere completely different than where you started, You've seen an example of systems in work. You have to be able to look at a situation and recognize that it's a complex system made up of multiple components. You have to actually be able to break things into their components. You have to look at the inputs into those components, the outputs from those components, and the flow of information between those components. You have to sort of, you know, look at a Lego toy and break it down into the individual pieces and see how they fit together in order to make the real thing. For example, you kind of have to take this principle and put it into real life. So everything, especially in the business world, everything is a system. It's not just one business. The business has different departments. They have different areas of research. They have different systems that are doing different things. And all those systems have to work together. They have to take data in, process that data, pass it on to the next system, and so on and so forth. And that is how, that is precisely what makes a business work. And you have to be able to understand these systems. Collaboration is another huge skill. Um, nobody can completely have a business running by themselves. You know, we train ourselves in very 
specialized areas. My training is in computer science. I do a lot of work in the theoretical areas, right? I've learned a lot of math. I can do a lot of really great models of real life systems and I can do computation on those models really well. For the life of me, I don't know how to do taxes. So you need, you know, if there's a business that I'm working at, I can do all the work that I can do really well, but then you still need an accountant. And then you still need HR, and you still need people who can actually manage the technology that I might be working on, and so on and so forth. You have all these different people that you would work together with, and even within your own field, right? You still have to be able to collaborate with other people. You can't just be the expert in your department. You're the person who does everything, because it's really important to be able to bounce ideas off of people. You have to be able to work with each other. You have to be able to give and accept critical feedback. The idea is that when you're working in a team, not everyone is going to be thinking the exact same way. And that difference in the way that people are thinking, the difference in experience leads to the synthesis of different ideas between different people. And then the feedback process, the critical feedback process is really important to shaping those ideas into something that really works. So collaboration is an incredibly important skill. And then finally, you have to be able to experiment. It's really important to try new things. It's really important to say, I don't know if this is going to work, but I can find out if it will work. I can make a small use case. I can apply my experiment here. I can look at the results and I can extrapolate those results to what would happen if I apply this experiment to the entire company. And I can gauge whether or not it's worth continuing this, going down this path based on my experiment. You have to be able to learn from failures and you also have to be able to learn how to make your failures not affect everything. And you, know, you have to be able to contain your failures to learn from your failures, and then to use that to motivate future decisions. And you have to be able to say, I don't know the answer to this question, but I know how I can find out the answer to this question. That is an incredibly important skill. All those non-routine skills will make you very hireable and they will make you very necessary to any business team. But another thing that you really need is these MIS, these technology skills. There's a huge demand for high-level technology skills. Employers want people who know how to use technology, and there's this massive mismatch between the skills that are being demanded and the actual low-level tech skills that are being held by employees. This is the technology skills gap. And what that means is that because there's this much higher demand for technology skills than there actually is available in the employment market, if you're able to learn these high-level technology skills, this actually makes you a very promising candidate and a very necessary member of any team. So it's a combination of the non-routine cognitive skills and the technology skills that you need to have. Now, because of this technology skills gap, there is an unfulfilled demand for people with technology skills, which means that businesses are willing to pay more for people who have these technological skills. So the more you're able to learn about technology, the more you're able to keep up with what's new, what's happening right now, the more you can get paid. And that truly is the end goal, is it not? Thank you all so much for watching this video. In the next video, we're actually going to start talking about the core MIS concepts. I'll, I'll stop saying MIS and you'll actually learn what it means. So thank you all very much for watching.